Hello, folks. Uh, thank you for coming today. Um, to, we have well, we have the pleasure of having Mark Lanto. He's going to talk about evaluating agents using uh, social choice theory. Um, Mark is a, an old uh, guest uh, of the of the multi learning seminar. He's been here, I think, at least a couple of times. Uh, but for you, also, uh, for both of uh, for some of you that might not know Mark, Mark is a research scientist at Google DeepMind where his research interests include multi l reinforcement learning, computational game theory, multi l system, and game research. In the past few years, Mark has been investigating game theoretic approach to multi l reinforcement learning with application to fully and partially observable zero-sum games, sequential social dilemmas, and negotiation and communication games. And in all these methods, he's been trying to uh, draw inspiration from classical approaches such as fictitious play, regret minimization, and trying to frame them in the more novel uh, reinforcement learning paradigm. Uh, in terms of like pedigree, I don't think we have to explain too much. Mark received a PhD in artificial intelligence from the Department of Computer Science at the University of Alberta in 2013. And before joining the mine, he completed a postdoctoral research fellowship at the Department of Knowledge Engineering at Maastricht University in Maastricht, the Netherlands, on Monte Carlo to research methods in games. So we are extremely happy and lucky to have Mark here today. And without any further ado, Mark, please, you have the floor. Okay, yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm going to tell you uh, about some work I've done with a number of great people there. So like, keep in mind, please, this is not just all me doing this, but I am quite excited by it. Um, and yeah, very thankful to uh, to be able to tell people about it this meeting. So thanks for coming in and thanks for listening. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to tell you about a, a paper that's called Evaluating Agents Using Social Choice Theory. Um, it's kind of neat because we had like a number of like candidate names for this. Um, whoops, hey, I can control it straight from the GBC. That's new for me. Okay, one minute. Okay. Um, yeah, so we had a nice, uh, a few playful names uh, as runners up. So I'm just going to present them because we could have called it the reevaluating, the reevaluation of evaluation. Um, that was another candidate name. And also, we could have said 200 plus years of social choice theory is all you need. But we went with the uh, rather boring title of evaluating agents using social choice theory. But before I tell you about that, I will tell you uh, there was a little. I, I, I wasn't sure what to talk about uh, for this meeting, so I there were it was between two things. I do want to tell you about this one other thing I chose you not to talk about for just thirty seconds. Um, so the, this is based on uh, a paper that was recently accepted at the uh, TMLR, um, and uh, it, it proposes this is more of a um, I guess uh, a multi agent reinforcement learning style uh, problem. So like uh, you know the. The reason I hesitated to, between these two topics for the for this talk was, you know, I had worked on. I haven't uh, actually done much multi-agent reinforcement learning in the past year, um, you know, compared to the last ten years. Um, and uh, the one thing I, I have done that's closer to multi-agent RL um, is this uh, this idea of population-based evaluation and repeated rock paper scissors as a benchmark for multi-agent RL. Um, so this is a cool little paper that's uh, proposing a benchmark, and it's a rather simple benchmark, um, where uh, you uh, you look at uh, how agents perform in a very simple task, uh, which is rock paper scissors, but played in a repeated fashion. Now there's people that play uh, competitions. There's actually humans that play competitions in this, but uh, there were some competitions that were run um, in the early 2000s uh, where people actually handcrafted bots um, for playing this game. Uh, and were evaluated in a kind of a population setup where there were like uh, uh, like uh, flawed bots, you know, that always play rock or always play paper and some other types of uh, bot non-optimal bots. Um, and the the competition was to um, you know see, maximize your return. Um, so we 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 built like a little environment around this, and uh, we uh, tried to apply some uh, some of the state of the art RL algorithms. And it turns out like this is actually a fairly hard problem, um, especially when uh, the bots are so good. Um, and we defined like a, a nice little uh, aggregate score that takes both into uh, you know population return and uh, exploitability into account. So I just wanted to advertise this uh, really quickly. So um, yeah, so there it is. Okay, let's talk a bit about um, social choice theory and evaluation. So a bit of motivation. 
Um, what we want to do is we want to evaluate general agents. So we're just going to say, just going to put a bold statement up here that evaluation is important in reinforcement learning. I hope that's not too controversial. There's been a number of papers on the subject now. Um, but I'm going to say it's especially important for general agents um, and even beyond RL agents. It's not just important for RL agents, but we're going to apply it to, for example, language models um, and uh, in the multi-agent case uh, to human agents as well. So uh, it's so important that there have been, you know, papers that just say we're doing evaluation wrong. Turns out you know, there's a few papers on the subject. Um, here's just one of them, reporting, think, rethinking, uh, reporting of evaluation results in AI. This was written by uh, a number of well-known people in the community, uh, presented last year, talking about you know some of the problems with evaluation. Um, there have been papers on uh, talking about uh, how to uh, properly evaluate agents in the Atari setting because you know there's been a lot of uh, work done in that area as well. So what do we like what do we have as options for uh, rating systems or, or ranking systems? Like how can we evaluate agents? So here's a simple one um, that is quite popular. It's called ELO. Um, it's a widely used rating system uh, invented uh, midway through last century. Um, used designed mainly for chess. So you, what happens in ELO is you have um, an agent has a single rating, it's a number. Um, and the idea is that this rating carries some semantics. So it's uh, intended to be uh, to provide a prediction of the probability that one agent beats another. And it's very simple. It's based on uh, a logistic function uh, of the difference in ratings. What's nice about ELO is that, like I keep saying, it's simple. It's widely used. Um, there's some problems with it that have been highlighted. We're going to talk about a few of them today. Um, it kind of assumes uh, transitivity in some sense. Um, we're going to see it's not robust to clones. Um, so if you have cloned agents, that could be that could be a problem, or at least that's going to affect your ELO values. Um, I'll show you one pathological example, um, and I will say that its interpretability is limited. You have one piece. Well, there's one way you can interpret an ELO uh, rating, which is uh, in this way it's shown on the slide. Um, so here's here's a commonly used example. So in the case of like rock paper scissors, this is a game where you know uh, one strategy will beat another one. Uh, rock will beat, uh, and and you have non-transitive relationships between uh, the uh, the strategy. So like rock will beat scissors, uh, paper will beat rock, uh, scissors will beat paper, and you can have like you know what's typically like a, a cycle in your. Uh, uh, in your like uh, preferred strategies. So what if you if you have an, a population of rock, paper, and scissors, um, like let's say each one of those uh, has a populations of size three, what you'll get if you run ELO is just that, that they all have the same value. Um, you're always gonna get a prediction. Uh, so if you take that, um, like the rate, the rating for rock, the rating for paper, the rating for scissors, and put it back into that logistic function, you're gonna just get a prediction that each one of them is gonna get uh, beat the other with a probability of a half. Um, but the problem is when you take a rock or a, a rock against a paper agent, um, the rock paper will always beat rock. Rock will always beat scissors. Um, so it's not really modeling uh, that you know strict relationship that is shown in this matrix. Um, here's another problem. Even in the case where you do have actually uh, transitive um, relationships, so like suppose you have uh, three agents in the population, A, B, A beats B with a probability of 55 or 55% of the time, B beats C 52% of the time, and A beats C 90% of the time. Um, you can have a problem here if, uh, for example, uh, you just increase the number of Bs in this population. So if you have a population of just A, B, and C, um, and you just take, you now increase the number of B agents but keep these probabilities the same. So the relationship uh, between each agent is the same. Um, it's going to be it's going to get harder and harder to predict that uh, ninety percent probability between A and C, because what's going to happen is you're going to put a lot of you're going to spend a lot of uh, effort trying to get the probabilities between A and C right, or A and B right, and A and B and C right, and that's just going to have an effect on how well you can predict uh, the probability of A, B, and C. Okay. So that's just an, a quick intro to ELO. Um, let's think about general agents. So like 
there's been a lot of you know excitement in um, general agents in the past few years um, going way back to the Atari learning environment so the Atari learning environment is a really nice general suite of environments where uh, you can assess a single agent or sing single type of agents or at least an agent that can accept uh, the same kind of uh, observations over a number of different environments and if you look at some of the papers they look like this or at least they have tables in them that look like this and this is a slide full of numbers and agents and it's like yeah there's some bolded numbers which help you understand okay maybe uh, this last one prioritized dueling uh, is in some sense better because maybe it's the top ranked one in a number of environments but really it's just a bunch of information um, and the question is how do you aggregate this information okay so there was another paper um, as you might know from my uh, alternative choice of titles uh, there's another paper that was quite inspiring called uh, reevaluating Eva evaluation it came out in 2019 by David Balduzzi and colleagues um, this one I you know I really like this paper it it turns the evaluation problem into a game between agents and tasks um, so the tasks or the environments here are like just the atari games and so here's an example of what it does so if you just look at these numbers here um, it's going to now design some kind of a game where uh, like the game that it basically solves is on the right over here where it thinks of each one of these scores um, as uh, like a payoff and uh, it turns it into this uh, this game between a uh, role, uh, role player, like the task player and the and the agent player, uh, and it solves this game. This one does not uh, assume a trans in uh, transitivity. Um, it has this nice property that's invariant, so it's re robust to these clones that I've been talking about. It has some interpretability um, that you can extract from just from the fact that it's Nash equilibrium. Um, it requires score normalization. So to get from uh, the like Atari scores to like this two players or some game that you have to solve, um, you have to normalize the scores per environment. Um, and we're going to see it does some aggressive task filtering. Um, it could also be sensitive to the population, um, and it imposes a task distribution. So like maybe that last one might not um, um, like be very clear, but you'll I think I think you'll appreciate it when you see some of the results. But essentially, what this is doing is. By turning it into a game, the task player is uh, coming up with a strategy, and a strategy represents like the weight that you put on each one of the tasks when you're solving this game. Okay, uh, is that a question or a comment? Maybe. Yeah, yeah. it's a question. Yeah. Um, hi. My yeah. question was, why is this uh, requirement on score normalization necessarily a bad thing? Um, that's a good question. I hope you'll have an appreciation after I show you some results. Okay. Um, but I guess the short answer is um, this you know, uh, the sensitive to population thing. Um, if I put in, uh, let's say I insert a column in here, and that change, that might change dramatically the values of the game that's shown on the bottom right. Uh, do you agree with me? Yeah. OK. And so I would say that could be a problem. Um, so, uh, even if the resulting rankings of the agents wouldn't be expected to change, um, by changing the values in the game and relying on, for example, a solution like the Nash equilibrium, um, that could make your, uh, ranking technique or sorry, evaluation technique kind of sensitive to the population. I see. Okay. I'll ask you to hold on to that thought because that'll become a bit more clear when I show you some results. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So, what does Nash averaging do? Okay. Well, so this is called, you know, the the, the, per, the method in this paper is called Nash averaging. Uh, I mean, there's more than one method in this paper, but the main ones uh, I'm going to talk about is called Nash averaging. And essentially, by taking this game, you find what you're what you do in this game is you find the maximum entry entropy Nash equilibrium, that's sigma, and then you calculate the value of each agent uh, against this, uh, or the expected value of each agent against this. Uh, a maximum entropy Nash equilibrium. What's nice is you get this invariance property that actually falls out of just the fact that it's a Nash equilibrium. Um, you get another, a, a few other ones as well. 
like uh, continuity and interpretability. Um, the, the one problem that I've been alluding to is what we've been calling this adversarial task selection problem. Um, so if you look at this graph here, this is like the, the support of the distribution under this Nash equilibrium that it finds in Atari. Um, this is not the one that was from their paper, but even, even the one from the paper has the, the problem that it puts very little weight on, or sorry, it puts most of the weight on very few tasks. Now we've called this, so so essentially what you're doing is you're taking like, you know, 54 games and uh, as a result of cranking it through this game and finding Nash equilibrium, you're then saying that like the, uh, like the rank of the agents are going to depend on this distribution that was found in this Nash equilibrium. Right, but the problem is then you're only uh, assessing the, the agents on these four games in this particular distribution. So we're going to see what you know if how does that cause problems. Um, it might not be cleared yet, but we'll see a few examples. Let's talk about the main method first. So he, he, I mean, here's the whole method kind of in an infographic. Um, what if each environment was a voter? Now I'm just going to mention Brian Tanner here because uh, there's an interesting story to how this idea came about. Um, you can think think of this dinosaur as just Brian Tanner asking, what if each environment was a voter? That's essentially how this uh, the, the, the whole story behind this work kind of started because uh, Brian really asked me that question and he pitched uh, this idea uh, to me uh, in 2018, I think. Um, and so that, that's exactly what we're going to do. So we're going to think of uh, each one of the environments as a voter and of what a voter does is it just submits like um, a, a ranking over agents, like a preference uh, over agents that comes in uh, like a sequence, like a total order. Okay, so let me expand a bit on that. So suppose we want to evaluate general agents. So by general agents, I just mean agents that are operating in like multiple different tasks. Um, we would like uh, the scores and like the scores and metrics might not in general be comparable across tasks. So like even in Atari, I can say that that's uh, that's true because uh, many of the games use different reward range, ranges, right? But but I'm going to take a more extreme example. Like let's say uh, you have three agents uh, and you want to maybe just um, and like find out how you know how uh, athletic they are generally, right? So you can pick uh, five different uh, like sports and you can ask them to compete in each sport um, and each one of those sports might have different uh, ways of, of scoring the agents right like synchronized swimming uh, how you score an agent in synchronized swimming might not really compare well to for example archery um, and in fact they might be subjective right like maybe you have a bunch of expert raiders that are uh, going to give you some kind of score um, and so sometimes those can't be easily quantified but you could rank the agents nonetheless. I mean, uh, we're doing this with uh, RL, RLHF in how we're training language models. Um, and like ultimately what we want is some kind of uh, evaluation system that's like robust and interpretable. So the question is how to properly uh, aggregate this data. What does properly even mean? Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna uh, cater to social choice theory. And we're gonna just turn all these things into votes. So here's what I mean by votes. So we have five different tasks. So just like the dinosaur was asking, right? Um, we can put this, uh, we can think of each one of these as a vote. So A is greater than B is greater than C. That's expressing some kind of a strict preference. Um, and we can do this for each one of our agents, or sorry, each one of our tasks or each one of our voters. And then we have five different uh, preferences, um, total O's, total orders over each one of these three agents. And we think of these things as just ballots. Like this, these are just votes. We're gonna pass this thing. Uh, we're gonna give all of our votes to a voting scheme, which might look like this. <laughs> um, and it's gonna crank out an answer. And that answer could take many forms, like just the top, you know, the best agent, uh, or just the final rank, like the total order over agents like like this one and maybe it gives some scores like it depends on which method you use but the main idea is that you're aggregating uh you're trying to find some aggregate ranking uh of each of these agents okay so let's so how do we do this like that was just a quick explanation of it um but uh we're going to use social choice theory where um 
the set of agents is uh, denoted A, which is just, or sometimes we call them alternatives. Um, the set of voters or environments is V. Um, so there's N of them. Um, each voter, as, as we saw in the example, each voter has a preference order um, over V. That's not true. That should be over A. Um, and this thing here, A, uh, this little bunny angle bracket just means that um, voter I prefers agent J to agent K. Um, and you can just chain those. And a preference profile is basically just a list of these, um, of rankings over uh, alternatives, we call them. Okay, and the what we want to do um, is find this social choice function. That's kind of the the first one, which is a function uh, that takes into a, takes a preference profile list of votes and outputs like a single agent um, or alternative. That is the classical way of doing. Uh, uh, that's the classical uh, goal, I guess, in social choice theory. Um, we're going to do something more general than that because we want rankings. So we're going to look for something called a social welfare function, which is essentially um, like a similar function, but it returns uh, like a total order over the over the agents. Uh, a number of these methods will do both. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Question. Yeah. Um, could you explain why the number of agents and the number of environments are different? Oh, yeah, yeah. So like, let's take the example of Atari. So uh, the, the example I used had uh, eight different agents. So like uh, the agents in this case are like, you know, the, the learning algorithm. So like DQN, uh, prioritized dueling, uh, dueling DQN, etc. And the number of environments or voters here would be like the number of games. So in that case, it would be 54. So just in general, it it's like a, you can think of the voters as the tasks. So when you're trying to figure out which agent is better than another agent, you're you're um, you're assessing them over uh, tasks, right? So like, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, got it. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So um, in we're going to get to the multi-agent the multi-agent case uh, where you have agents competing with other agents, um, but think of a the, think of the, the the agent versus task case for now. Um, okay, so so this is just a bit of a primer on uh, social choice theory. If you know, if you've taken a course on this, or if you've read any books, you know, it's on like you know, the second or third page. You're going to encounter the the most famous uh, result in social choice theory, which is called Arrow's theorem. Um, and so Arrow's theorem is a what's called an impossibility result. It's it's a negative. It's a thing that is unfortunate because it's going to it's going to make a statement about uh, about how restricted uh, those uh, that class of functions you can find is. So uh, you know, there's there's a few properties. So this is just informal. Um, there's a you would like for your function f to be Pareto efficient. So uh, this this social choice function is Pareto efficient if um, <clears throat> all of the voters prefer a to b implies that your um, your social choice function will also rank A over B. I should say social welfare function in this case. Um, there, there's another property called the uh, independence of a relative alternative, uh, relevant alternatives. So uh, your, which states that your function F uh, ranks A and B. Uh, they only depend on the relative ranks of A and B among the voters. So if there's like, uh, you know, if, if you always see uh, a and B ranked uh, similarly amongst agents that doesn't depend on like some other agent C. Um, that should be the only thing determining uh, how A and B rank in, uh, in in the function F. Um, like the, the C's are usually called distractors, right? If the, if there's a, a distractor that doesn't uh, that is not relevant, that's I guess why they call it irrelevant alternatives so like uh, that doesn't determine how a and B are ranked uh, in this function F um, yeah if, if that property holds then it's called uh, that you're, you're satisfying this property called IIA and dictatorial is another property where uh, your function F is mark is deemed dictatorial if there's only one if there's only one voter that's determining the winner right so that's typically a bad thing um, and uh, Arrow's theorem is basically saying, uh, you know, if there's a, if there's 
three or more alternatives, um, then if if your function is both Pareto efficient and satisfies independence of a relative alternatives, then it has to, then it must be dictatorial. Um, so you cannot have you know all these you can't have non you can't have a fun, uh, social choice function that is non dictatorial but also Pareto efficient and and IIA. So this is yeah how why does this matter in agent evaluation? Um, it did, that may be not clear yet, but um, like think of this, uh, just think of this as the no, there's no perfect F that exists, right? There's not, you would like the, you would like the social choice function that you find to, uh, to have certain properties, but there's just certain, uh, there's a number of properties that can't exist together because of arrows and possibility theorem. Now that's, I'm gonna say that, um, and that's actually true uh, in most cases. And there's one case that, like where you can kind of get out of it in in uh, in, in one case that we're going to talk about. Um, okay, but this is yeah, this is all sort of classical social choice. Um, okay, so to to I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, like I, I need to introduce a little bit of terminology now to to describe some of the methods. So we use this uh, notation n. So n is a function of uh, two specific agents, um, and it basically counts the number of voters that rank uh, one agent above the other. So think of just like the number of like number of games that uh, like DQN is preferred to the human. Um, and there's a very uh, there's a very important concept in social choice called Condorcet winner. So if if it's the case that for all agents in your agent pool, if um, the number of voters that prefer agent A to any other agent is greater than the number of uh, voters that prefer that other agent you're comparing to to A. So think of this as if you if you take one agent and you you head, you want to compare it head to head with all the others, right? So you have agents A, B, C. If agent A has more votes that prefer A to B than B to A. But that's also true from A to C and C to A. Um, then you can think of this as it's winning in a head-to-head -head matchup when counting number of voters in terms of preference. So, like, um, it it's it's a natural choice for a winner. Um, that might seem a little abstract. So let's go through an example. I gave you this example before, where we have three agents and uh, five different tasks, so five votes. Um, and we can come up with these matrices that count exactly these number of votes. So like, for example, the if you, if you look at this voter preference matrix here, in the bottom left uh, cell, you have a three, right? That's because <clears throat> the number of votes where C is preferred to A is three. So there's three out of five votes where that's true. Uh, so there's another matrix that's relevant, which is the voter margin matrix, which is just you know, this preference matrix minus its transpose. And that basically shows you, uh, like the bottom left has a, uh, has a one there, and that's counting how many votes, where, how many votes are there where C is preferred to A minus the number of votes where A is preferred to C. And so that's a one, because there's five votes total. So there's three, three votes where C is preferred to A, and there's uh, two votes where A is preferred to C. And so, uh, well, yeah, what's neat about these these matrices is that a lot of the voting methods I'll talk about are actually functions of just these matrices. So you can you can compute these, and then there's some operations that happen over these over these matrices. And in particular, it, it's the voter margin matrix is kind of useful because you can right away by inspection tell whether or not there's a, a Condorcet winner. So um, agent C, if it, if all of your values in this voter margin matrix are uh, positive, except for the diagonal, which is always gonna be zero, then by definition, this this agent is a, a Condorcet winner. So the Condorcet winner doesn't always exist, but in this case, uh, there is one, and uh, that's agent C. Okay, so I'm gonna come back to ELO while I'm on this example. So the question is, Suppose you have a preference profile that looks like this. Um, how would you apply ELO to the setting? 
Well, one way that's typically done, I mean, ELO as an input takes as input uh, pairs of like wins and losses or draws, um, and so one way you can uh, you can you can try to apply ELO to this preference profile here is by just saying, well, if A is ranked above B, that counts as a win for A and a loss for B. Um, and then that'll give you a database of wins and losses, and then you can go and, and compute the ELO, um, ELO ratings if you want to. And so if you try to do that on this example, um, what you'll see is this graphic on the right. So the win rates uh, of, so A, uh, C will be A 60% of the time, C will be B 60% of the time, and uh, A will be B 80% of the time, okay? Now, okay, that's fine. And then you can go off and run ELO and, and you'll get some numbers. One thing that surprised me a little bit uh, was that, or I mean, one question you might have is, you know, if if you think uh, Condorcet winner is a nice candidate for like the top ranked agent, I mean, that kind of, that's sensible because um, that agent is beating every other agent in head-to-head -head matchups in terms of the number of votes. Um, well, then will the will the ELO rating system always have, uh, will, will it always top rank a Connor Singer? And the answer is no. So in this example, uh, what ends up happening um, is that uh, agent C and agent A uh, will have the same rating. And this is not a numerical thing. Like you can show that the gradients uh, as you, like if you look at the ELO gradients, you can work out that they're exactly the same. And uh, essentially the reason is that uh, the the win rates for both agents uh, is the same. So like agent C will win against either one of its opponents with probability 60%. And that's, that's also true for agent A. It's gonna be agent B with 80% of the time, but it's also gonna be agent C 40% of the time and average that gives you 60%. So in this example, um, if you work out like uh, the ELO update, you'll see um, that uh, agents A and agents C will always be top ranked, or will always, sorry, will always have the same ELO value, despite the fact that C is, is a Connor winner. So what ELO is doing and what, you know, social choice theory are, is doing, or at least this con this notion of Connor say are two different things. Okay. So let's talk about why we want to do this and what we did. Okay, yeah, sorry, no. question. Yeah, there's a quick clarifying question in the chat. Um, how do we go from the score in a particular environment to the vote? Oh yeah, you just, um, you you rank, uh, you sort the, the values and then uh, you take the sorted, uh, the agents as they're sorted by their values. Does that make sense? So like um, if we have, uh, a, like if DQN scores like a thousand, prioritized DQN scores two thousand, then the vote will be prioritized DQN beats DQN. A B A greater than B. Does that make sense? Like in a, in a, I guess I, what I should say more generally, in a setting where you have those numbers, um, you can just sort those numbers. Like you can sort the agents, you can just rank the agents by numerically by those numbers, and that will give you the vote. So, um, just a follow up question. So, yep. the score, the difference between the scores in environments doesn't matter. It's just about the ranking. Correct. Exactly. And that's um, that's a very good observation because that's exactly how ELO differs from the social choice setup, right? The social choice setup is specifically removing the magnitudes. But aren't you going to have some strange cases then where, let's say, it's a little bit better in one environment than the other, and then uh, you're completely going to change the ranking? But I mean, maybe, yeah. You, <laughs> if, uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. So, so it's a very good observation because you have to trust um, that the numerical values are accurate enough to turn that into a vote. So yeah. um, it's a very good observation because we ran it on some stochastic environments and that didn't get you into trouble. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we listed as a point of future work and we've already done the work in that area. <laughs> but, okay. but in the case, yes, in the case where you're pulling, where you're actually translating uh, returns to votes, uh, you have to be careful how you, do, how, you, how you do that. One of them is you can just like 
in the case of Atari, you can just take the average uh, of like, you know, hundreds of thousands of runs, right? Um, and then compare averages. But those two things are losing information, such as the distribution that they were drawn from. Um, and that might actually, uh, you know, that could change how the vote turn up. Uh, yeah, I guess or the, one, of, one very simple thing I think you could do is just take the normalized by the max across all your agents per environment. That's what Nash averaging does. Oh, good. Okay. So Nash averaging will. But before you convert it to votes, I mean. Um, that should not change the voting. Oh yeah, you're talking about the overall max across mm -hmm. all the environments. Yeah, if you do that though, uh, you're you're assuming that the uh, that the values are comparable across environments. No. Nope. Okay, maybe I can. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Maybe, maybe you mean per. Yeah, maybe you mean per task map uh, average. But yeah, per task. Per, yeah. 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 Exactly. Thanks. That makes sense. Um, yeah, it's a good point. But it, it is. A, it's a very good point. The Elo and uh, the social choice mechanism for evaluating the agents are definitely going to be doing these different things, and so and uh, on purpose they're forgetting the values of the scores. Um, so if that matters for your application, then uh, you know there needs to be a fix for that, um, and and we have a few proposed fixes. But but what I will I'll just uh, the one of the we see it as a feature rather than a bug because one of the things we want is to have an evaluation system that could take in rankings where you don't necessarily have rewards or scores. Okay, and so we actually have that for one of our. Uh, our, our, our examples. OK, so there's a number of voting methods uh, we used. Voting methods come in two different flavors. Well, actually, kind of three. But the, the main two are these scoring rules, which basically just count like you know number of wins or um, in various ways. They attach like numerical values to each one of the positions, and then they aggregate them. And then there are these Condorcet methods that basically are uh, preserve this property of Condorcet consistency. Um, which I think I have here, yeah. So these are these robustness properties I was talking about. Um, Condorcet consistency, if your voting scheme is Condorcet consistent, then it returns a Condorcet winner if it exists. So uh, that that's a particularly nice one because, you know, there have been arguments that Condorcet uh, is, you know, the natural choice of best agent. And so there's a number of uh, voting schemes that fall into that category. And there's there's other forms of consistency. The cl the clone consistency that I well, I vaguely mentioned. Uh, sorry, I very quickly mentioned the case of clones in Elo. Uh, if you have um, if you have a voting scheme that is clone consistent, it means that you can uh, add as many clones of agents as you want, and it's not going to affect uh, how you evaluate them. So that's a very strong property. Nice to have. Population consistency is another one where you can subdivide your your votes into like subsets, <clears throat> and if all the subsets, uh, if you applied a voting scheme to all the subsets, and the top uh, the the socially preferred agent in each one of the subsets um, is, uh, if all the subsets basically agree on the on the winner, then uh, the the union of all the votes uh, is also a winner. Um, so there's there's some nice uh, properties that you can kind of import from social choice theory that like you know is nice to have for uh, in your evaluation system. Um, the problem is that not because of Arrow's theorem, not all of these can can coexist. So uh, here's an example of the ones that we've used. So the the first four are just counting methods. So you've heard of these: first past the post, plurality, probably board account, approval voting. Um, single transfer, singular, singular transferable vote, um, and uh, this is one of these uh, conflicts, right? So population consistency and uh, clone consistency cannot coexist together um, in deterministic voting rules. So that's why the second row and the third row uh, you don't see uh, together, and they're separated across these different types. So the Condorcet consistent rules, some of them are also clone consistent. Now I'm going to tell you about a, a deterministic, uh, probabilistic way of doing uh, voting that actually does allow you to bypass 
uh, the usual arrows there. Okay, but because I'm I'm taking I'm running out of time, I will go through just this part quickly because I want to get through some of the results because they're actually kind of cool. Okay, so you can uh, you can cast voting as a probabilistic in a probabilistic way. So instead of having a function that chooses um, the an agent deterministically, you can say, oh, if my voting scheme is probabilistic, then uh, there's a uh, it's gonna yeah it's gonna choose a it's going to give a distribution over agents and then uh, the idea is that you you know given that distribution you just sample from it and that's your winner now uh, it, it you know these these are not very you know widely implemented in practice as I'm sure you know uh, for the obvious reasons um, but theoretically um, they're quite nice because they solve some certain problems so there's some uh, fairness properties that like a lot of voting systems don't have because uh, there's no uh, like uh, you have to you have to figure out a tie-breaking rule, right? Um, so you can just flip a coin and that makes things fair. Uh, there's other uh, like impossibility results that uh, that occur because you have deterministic voting rules, but they're never really used in practice because yeah, people can't. You know, it's kind of hard to accept that you know you're going to vote on your <laughs> leader using uh, like a die roll, right? But it turns out in evaluation, I think uh, there's a good reason to do this. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about maximal lotteries because I think that is the one method that you can pull out. It bypasses, uh, it allows you to have all the robustness properties in one one place, in one uh, method, and it's really cool because it turns the turns the voting problem into a game, and it does that by acting by thinking of. So it's actually quite related to Nash averaging when you think about it, because Nash averaging is going to turn the scores into a game. What maximal lotteries is going to do is turn the margin matrix into a game. Um, and the way you want to interpret this is imagine, so the margin, remember what the margin matrix is. It's, um, there's an entry, in each entry, there's uh, the difference of votes between agents, the number of voters that prefer agent A minus the number, uh, to B, minus the number of agent uh, votes that prefer B to A. And so if you think of uh, like the definition of a maximal lottery is some distribution over agents such that for any other district, for any other like opponent distribution, your the expected margin is greater than zero. So your expected margin being greater than zero is good. What that means is that, you know, your probability distribution P, uh, P over here over agents um, is, um, is a good one because no matter what, for every other uh, uh, distribution that you can choose over your opponent, um, you have an expected positive margin. Um, so this might look familiar to people who are used to who are like uh, familiar with zero sum games. This is actually just a zero sum game over a two player zero sum game over the margin matrix. Okay, what's nice about that is we know how to solve two player zero sum games. They're efficient. Um, we know what the value of the game is. Like this, in, the, in particular, this game has to be zero um, because it's a symmetric matrix. Um, we have the minimax theorem that says they're always guaranteed to exist, and uh, they're like efficiently computable. Um, in in this paper, we we introduced like a new, uh, well, a slight improvement over maximal lotteries, um, which is uh, what something that we call uh, iterative maximal lotteries. So you take the voter mar margin matrix. Um, you solve this two-player game to find this distribution, and then uh, you pull out the winning agents, and the winning agents could be multiple of them, because the distribution that you get out of this um, uh, out of the solution co of the concept, like Nash, uh, could be uh, like it could be a, more than one agent that you're uh, uh, putting a distribution over. So, um, and then but then you iterate this process. So you take out the winners, the ones that are top ranked. Um, and then you just keep uh, repeatedly playing this game until you have no agents left. Um, and so in practice, what this does is it actually makes like a bunch of, you can think of these different groupings as like, well, I call them levels. Um, and so, uh, for example, when you apply this to Atari, uh, we, we applied this to the Atari data from the rainbow paper. Um, you get like, uh, you can, you can, uh, see the levels here just in the way that you can define the score. So 
uh, we define a score of each one of the agents as um, like uh, each one of the agents in that like uh, game theoretic level uh, shares like one uh, score that we we made up the scoring system for uh, maximal lottery. So like the way to interpret this is like rainbow uh, is the best agent. It, it was the one that won the first game in that iterative game process. And so we pulled out rainbow. Then we played a game with all the rest of the agents again. Um, it turns out there was only one winner or one, uh, the Nash equilibrium assigned probability one on distributed uh, distributional DQN. <clears throat> and then so it pulled that one out and then it pulled prior DQN out. And then it turns out um, there was uh, two winners in, in, the, in the third game that was played uh, between dueling DQN and A3C. And the way that you can see that, like the, the way that we define the score here is just like the, it's according to the level that you're in. So you start at the maximum number, which is nine in this case, if there's nine levels. Uh, and then the probability that your uh, that the agent was chosen in that game that you're solving is reflected in the score here. So five, so eight, you know, it would choose dueling DQN with probability 0.83 and A3C with probability 0.17. And so what's nice is um, you want, like you can see straight from the score um, that rainbow was a uh, was a winner with probability one in the first level, uh, and you can you know you can separate agents this way, and so you can we apply this to a different uh, data set the adaptive uh, adaptive agents paper, and in that case there were like a, I think 152 tasks, and uh, we got agents that were like much. Uh, much more mixed, right? Like the iter iterative maximal lotteries was finding uh, a lot of different mixed distributions because there was like you know, tons of different tasks. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> I started by saying like I wouldn't take up the full hour and now I've got eight minutes left, but that's okay because I've, I just have a, a few results now. So um, we applied this to the Atari learning environment. That was, uh, the data was taken from, uh, from the rainbow DQN paper. So in this case, there were eight agents, 54 Atari games. And like I said before, the preferences of a voter was like the ordering of the agents by decreasing order of score. And so one thing that we found out, which was a bit of a surprise, I, didn't, I, you know, I, I wouldn't have been able to tell you this by just looking at the, the, the charts of numbers. Um, there was no repeated votes. So over the 54 different games, all of the permutations over the eight agents were different. Um, that was cool. We didn't know that. Um, and uh, Rainbow DQN is a strong Condorcet winner. That's not a surprise based on the set of agents that were chosen. And uh, we, yeah, we applied the voting rules and we found uh, different distributions depending on the rule. But what's interesting is that these might look like different sequences, but they're not that different because uh, really the only thing that's different about them is that A3C is in different positions. Otherwise, the ranks are all, all the same. Now, what's interesting about that is that A3C was the only policy gradient method that was used um, in all of these set, in these eight agents. So it's like a fundamentally different type of agent than these value-based DQN methods. So that's, that's kind of interesting. If you run Nash averaging on this, you're gonna get a four-way tie between A3C, distributional DQN, rainbow, and dueling DQN the task distribution that you find is going to put some weight over assault, boxing, breakout, and venture, okay? So this is one of the highlights. This was one of these like adversarial task selections that problems, right? Because in the end, you're really scoring your agents um, by you know selecting a, a subset of four of the tasks and using that as a distribution. Okay. Here's another thing. So if you add two agents to this mix, so we took the scores from random uh, random player and a human agent. So now we added two, uh, two agents to the list. Um, what's nice, especially in the Condorcet methods, um, they, the, the ranks are almost identical. Actually, I think in this case they are identical. So the, the, human, uh, the human agent um, and, uh, and the uh, the random agent um, were actually um, like adding the human and the random agent did not change the relative ranks of uh, the other agents. So, so these eight that are shown here were uh, 
entire almost entirely the same as if they were just uh, the, the just the original eight agents from before. Um, but if you put that through Nash averaging, uh, okay, you get uh, a four-way uh, tie again between A3C distrib distributional DQN rainbow and this time human. So that didn't change too much, but the actual task distribution changed uh, uh, by a fair bit. So you get uh, four different, uh, three different games. I think there's only one in common. Um, Asterix, Breakout, Gopher, and Montezuma's Revenge. So this is what I was talking about earlier. And again, um, you're only uh, you're only uh, assessing your agents over four of the tasks out of the 54. Um, OK, so we applied this to um, language model tasks as well. The one I thought was pretty neat was um, uh, Agent Bench. So Agent Bench was this um, paper where they try to get language models to act as agents in like reinforcement learning like environments, uh, the eight different environments. Um, and uh, they compare, uh, the, this was last, sometime last summer, I think. Um, and so uh, we were able to look at these, uh, these values. And again, uh, these were different environments, so not really comparable scores across environments. Um, but we were still able to put it through our system. And, and for example, uh, you can tell again from this maximal lotteries uh, method that like the, the first top, the, these are the top agents here. You can tell just by the scores that like, uh, you know, GPT-4 was uh, a Condorcet winner because it won, uh, it won that first game or it was select only in the set, in the maximal lottery set. And then you start, uh, you know, solving these iterative games and you have, uh, Claude next and GPT 3.5 Turbo. Uh, but then uh, the rank seven and eight agent uh, were also put into it, like this game theoretic grouping uh, of a level. Uh, so it's like you see this also in, like you see some of this uh, game theoretic, uh, like cyclic process in uh, the, uh, yeah, in the scores of the, of the agents, even in other, uh, like even in not necessarily game theoretic domains. Um, and you could, and one of the methods called ranked pairs um, actually builds a graph out of this uh, margin matrix. And the way it's it it actually finds a rank is it topologically sorts this graph, and it's kind of neat to like visualize what this graph looks like because uh, you can very quickly look at the edge weights, and that's the margin. So that's uh, counting like how many tasks did GPT-4 beat. Uh, T bison 001 and minus the number of times like T bison beat GPT-4. So you can very quickly see, uh, you know, visually how each one of these uh, agents kind of uh, like, uh, you know, scores against the other agents. So you get some, some kind of nice interpretability there. Um, I left myself two minutes, but this is like the most exciting one. <laughs> so sorry about that, but I will, I'll go through it because I think I can do it in two minutes. The question is, what about the multi-agent case? <laughs> multi-agent case is really interesting. Um, so there's an agent versus agent case. Uh, so imagine um, you have a, a, a multiplayer game now. So we're not just talking about agents in different tasks. We're, you know, maybe Kate and Brian and and David Balduzzi and me are taking our role playing a four-player card game, right? Uh, we can play our four-player card game. And uh, maybe it assigns us points, and then at the end we can we can assemble those points into a rank, like show. So so we did this over a game called Diplomacy. So we had so in Diplomacy, what we were doing there were human players that played uh, online in uh, this this data set web Diplomacy. So it was an online game played between uh, players between the years of 2008 and 2019. Seven player game. Uh, there were 31,000 games, about 31,049 games, played over 53,000 agents, roughly. That's like a lot of agents. If you if you try to look at the the voter margin matrix, less than 1% of them have non-zeros. So very, very sparse because there's a lot of agents, right? Because you don't, not every agent will play against every other agent. Um, and the way that you can turn outcomes into votes is by just looking at the final uh, like supply centers that they have in the game. That's like roughly how well they did in the game. And if the winning condition is, you know, getting 18 supply centers and you can turn these into like votes that look like this at the bottom. Um, and what you can do is you can split, because there's 31,000 games, you can split this into a training set and a test set. 
and on your training set you can run uh you can train you can run your evaluation method on your train set it's going to produce a ranking and you can ask like how well does that ranking predict the outcome of each individual game right so a ranking is just a total ordering over agents so you can take that ranking that your evaluation system returned to you and you can go over each one of these games and you could say well um it, if I were to take the ranking of the agents in this game, what would the ranking tell me that how they're supposed to be ranked? You can use like a Kendall Tau distance to kind of count the number of disagreements in the in the way that they're ranked. And you could find the average Kendall Tau distance over all the games in your test set. And so, yeah, that was nice. So like I'm, I'm mostly done now. What's what what we found is that, uh, you know, you can you can run ELO on this in the way that we described uh, and uh, you can run the voting methods and not all the voting methods outperform ELO But ELO is a hard one to apply to the setting because there's a lot like diplomacy is one of these games where You can expect that there's a lot of non transitivity because it's a very complex seven player game um, and uh, yeah, we found that some of the uh, like some of the uh, especially the um, the Condorcet methods were were like Copeland in particular did uh, was was uh, able to uh, to rank these better than uh, than the other methods um, but what's interesting about this case is that it's there's a lot of agents so the com computational complexity starts to matter i'll finish there um, the main message um, you can use social choice theory to uh, to evaluate agents uh, one of the nice things you get you don't need scores you don't need to normalize um, you can you can build a preference profile from just subjective assessments um, and it provides some kind of, it provides robustness um, and interpretability by these consistency properties. There's one particular uh, method that's better than the others because it gives you the all of the uh, consistency properties that you want. It's called maximal lotteries. Um, one thing that we did, we did a very simple uh, tie-breaking rules. Um, the handling of the sparse data case, like the diplomacy one, is a bit of a tricky situation because a lot of the voting methods kind of assume the dense case. Um, and yeah, definitely what you know, somebody asked about earlier factoring into like the uncertainty and the statistics that you have in your numerical values is probably important in some cases too. Okay, so I'll leave it there with questions. I'm sorry I went over. Anybody who has, I'm happy to kind of answer any questions you have if you can stick around. Um, but uh, but if you want to take a deep, if you want to look into the paper here, it's what it's called. Um, it's on archive and yeah, feel free to, of course, uh, email me with any questions. Thanks. Awesome. Um, I think we, with that, um, we want to first thank our speaker. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, and I think we can stop the recording um, since we're at the hour or slightly after the hour.